Welcome, everybody, to a special Live with Kevin, a special episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. Why? Because it's not at Monday at noon. we got a special episode today. Uh, question. Culture is on everybody's mind, right? Like that word gets used more now in organizations than ever before. Have you ever wondered how to actually create the one that you want? Have you thought about the role that you play in creating it? Uh, and, and would you like to create one that perhaps using the words of my guests I'm going to introduce in a second, would you like to create a culture that doesn't suck? Well, welcome to another live episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. I'm so glad that you're here. And while you're here, uh, I hope that you will uh, interact with us by saying where you're from, tell me where you're from, tell us, say hello, all of those sorts of things. We want to get you used to commenting because we want you to interact with us throughout the course of the next few minutes. I want you to imagine that you're joining my guests and I for a cup of coffee. So if you've got questions or comments or ideas, I hope that you will share them. It will make for a more relevant conversation for you and for others, as opposed to the questions that Kevin has prepared. So we'll have a better conversation and we'll have a better podcast for those that join us later. And speaking of later, if you're watching this or listening to this after it comes out on the podcast, you could have done this months ago when we did it live. So you can get all future live episodes and interact with us like our live folks can by joining us on our Facebook or LinkedIn groups. Just go to remarkablepodcast.com slash Facebook or remarkable.com, excuse me, remarkablepodcast.com slash LinkedIn to do that. Hope you will. And let me tell you that today's episode is brought to you by Remarkable Masterclasses. It's our take on learning new skills in an advanced masterclass format. They're designed to help you become the remarkable leader and human you were born to be. Uh, details on how to get on board for a specific skill and to get discounts each month can be found at remarkablemasterclass.com. And with that, I'm going to bring in our guests. There they are. If you're with a slide, you can see them. And let me get my script back up so I can introduce them properly. First of all, Chris Edmonds. Uh, I've known Chris for a long time. He's a speaker, author, and executive consultant who is the founder of The Purposeful Culture Group. He's one of Inc. Magazine's top 100 leadership speakers and was featured as a presenter at South by Southwest. He's the author of the Amazon bestseller, The Culture Engine, and his blog, podcasts, and videos can be found at drivingresultsthroughculture.com. Also with us today is his writing partner and my new friend, Mark Babbitt. He's the president of Work IQ, a community and change management consultancy that helps organizations understand leadership's impact on culture and the company's collective level of workplace intelligence. Uh, he uh, is also the CEO and founder of U Turn. This career focused community enables college students, recent grads, and young professionals to find their first or next internship or job with the right organizational culture for them. In 2014, he co-authored a book called A World Gone Social, How Companies Must Adapt to Survive. And his writing has been published in Entrepreneur Magazine, Forbes, and many other publications. Like Chris, he was named to Inc. Magazine's Top 100 Leadership Speakers, and me too. Um, <laughs> together, they've written the brand new book, the Amazon bestseller, Good Comes First. Good Comes First, sorry. Welcome, guys. Glad to have you here. That is the single best intro we have ever experienced. That was remarkable, Kevin. We're well, delighted to be here. Well, you wrote it, so uh, <laughs> that, well, that's not completely. True. It was all all delivery. You said the whole thing with the the whole long, long thing with a smile on your face. So well, I, I I did edit it a little. I mean, I shut, shorted it, shortened it down. So we got Indianapolis in the house, not just me. Uh, we've got Orlando in the house. We've got hot chocolate in, from Belgium. <laughs> We've got uh, Eagle, Idaho. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. Eagle, Idaho, but it yeah. sounds like a great place to be. We've got uh, Sutter Health Plus. Dana, welcome. We've got um, South Africa. So, so far, we've got South Africa, the United States, Belgium, and from Colorado, these two guys. So uh, let's dive in. So first of all, how did you guys come to work together. I'll let you guys sort of traffic cop between you unless I have something specifically I want to ask one of you or the other. Okay. Awesome. How did you come to work together? Well, I'll, uh, we, Chris, uh, like you and Chris, uh, 
Chris and I knew each other for years on social and digital media, and we followed each other's work considerably. And uh, and then uh, unplanned, we ended up at the same culture focused conference in Chicago. And uh, and I was a along with my business partner at the time was a closing keynote speaker. And that I looked down, and there's Chris Edmonds. So we ended up at a steakhouse that night talking forever about leadership's impact on culture and and how leaders didn't seem to understand their impact on culture that was seven years ago chris it was and so we we it took we kept, you seven years to write a book come on i think well, it probably took us seven I'm, years to figure I'm out totally this guy kidding. this guy's kind of exactly what he presents himself to be it was very cool <laughs> Well, uh, the reality is we started writing this, uh, Kevin, three years ago, and we were almost done with the thing, and then this little pandemic hit, and it changed everything, and we could no longer ask leaders to embrace remote work because in the last three weeks, they've had no choice, and so we kind of had to pivot, and and so, yes, we were uh, we, we were waiting for the right moment to, to do this. Um, Yes, the fact that the pandemic hit us and we were all working from home, we weren't traveling and speaking as much afforded us the opportunity to actually put things on paper, but it also created a little bit of a, a pivot midstream. Perfect. Well, and so, Kevin, if I can add to that, please, one of the things that's, that's delightful about my partnership with Mark, number one, he's in the same state, hour and a quarter away, uh, so we get to see each other on a, on a pretty regular basis, but the alignment of our minds about helping educate leaders to do this different because most work cultures do suck and and it, it doesn't have to right we've we've all had good bosses some of us have had great bosses and and there's a template there's a bit of a, a pattern to what they did so to be able to have mark come in mark's and my businesses have started to overlap a bit we're kind of working on with each other's clients it's just been very very um gratifying to be able to do that and and to be able to get this book done with all the curveballs thrown at it and and we think it's it's very beneficial so so people are responding already and and we hope that'll continue there it is again if you're watching good comes first how today's leaders create an uncompromising company culture that doesn't suck <sighs> got all that out now um so you both you both have been passionate about culture for a long time. You sort of found each other and have continued to build that along the way. Now, uh, there is lots written about culture, and, and I, I'm with you that not leaders don't always recognize their role in it. And I actually, perhaps my favorite word in the title is the word create. Uh, <laughs> but before we get to that idea, I want to start with the first word. It's on Mark's shirt. It's actually on Chris's sleeve. You just can't see it. That word good. So... Um, in the context of this, what defines good? Like, what do you mean? Like, look up the word good in the dictionary. There's a whole lot of definitions and a whole lot of meanings. Like, what do you mean by good here? Well, I'll tell you, the, the, as you know, Kevin, one of the first things we say is we're going to, in the book, is we're going to tell you what good means to us. And we're going to give you some examples of companies that we believe fall in the good category most of them by a long ways or we probably wouldn't have put them in the book i suppose uh, and we also gave examples and name names of good company or bad companies and ugly companies uh to you know to balance things out but we say we're going to give you our idea of good and we're going to create uh, for instance our foundational principle is we must equally value respect and results and the, our research and our work shows clearly demonstrates that the companies who do that well are probably a they probably have a good company culture if say not, that again mark so people they, got it they must equally value respect and results and and kevin you know you've been in the leadership space for for years leaders are driven by results they're measured by results they're compensated by results we have not asked those leaders very often some do it instinctively but we haven't asked them to to measure the degree to which we show our peers, our coworkers, our managers, our people, our vendors, our all the stakeholders respect in the workplace, and and so that that we know from our again from our research and our work that 
we know that is the key to creating what we define as a good company culture. And then, Kevin, we go on to say, we can't define that for you. You, your leadership team, your key employees, your key vendors, you must sit in a room and co-create that definition. So we're all on the same page and we know what it means within these walls, within within this Zoom call, you know, during the next uh, corporate retreat or the or the next uh, the, the next meeting on Zoom. It right. it's your definition to make and and it has to be democratic to the point where people go, yeah, you know what? I can I can I can believe in that. I can live that. Well, and if I can add, Kevin, one of the pieces that we realize is just as there's a dozen different iterations of what good means in the dictionary, there's there's a dozen different <clears throat> definitions of what respect means in the dictionary. And so we try and, with leaders, give them a little bit of a, uh, let's call it guardrails, right? Yeah. And to basically say, the employee experience is hugely important because that creates buzz. It can be positive buzz. It can be, oh my God, <laughs> negative buzz, right? So how people are treated day to day in every interaction is something that leaders must pay attention to. And they look at us like we're crazy. It's like my job isn't to manage the quality of respectful interactions. It's to drive performance. So we do help them along to say, well, if you've got respect in place, service goes up, engagement goes up, and profits go up by 30% plus. And they go, excuse me, right? right. That That is something they've been trained to focus upon. So the guardrails are simple, that, that if employees are treated with respect and validated for their ideas, efforts, and contributions every day, that's good. You're heading in the right direction, right? Yeah. So, so you know, one of the things that, and you and the three of us talked before we went, uh, before we went live, a little bit about, and you mentioned it too, uh, about how the book uh, adjusted, shifted, changed because of the pandemic, uh, and I think that perhaps not just because of the pandemic, but I would just say, you know, in recent times, if you will, that perhaps. Um, the expectations that we as society have or that employees might have uh, on what organizations might look like or do has changed. So I guess my question is, and, and the way I put it on this uh, on the bottom here is probably not exactly right. It, it not is good more important now, but maybe how, uh, and Chris, I'd love for you to take this. How is good more important now or like, or why? is yeah. good more important than now than ever perhaps well the you know, the blessings of of the pandemic and and that seems like an interesting way of looking at that but what it has allowed leaders to do is to stop and reflect now maybe they didn't intend to reflect but the great resignation uh, or, or maybe it's the great attraction, right? I saw that in, in a McKinsey study we looked at last week about it's more attractive for people to not go to work at places where they're treated with disrespect, demeaned, discounted, uh, with toxic colleagues, toxic bosses. So the interesting lever right now for leaders is to say, well, you know, we, we can reopen our restaurant, we can reopen our office. So therefore I'm gonna go and plug everybody back into the old ways we used to do things. And we have evolved. Employees have choice today. And we're seeing that. I think uh, the most recent data we saw was 4.4 million in the U.S. voluntarily separated from their jobs in September. That's over 24 million since April. That is the highest number ever recorded by our Bureau of Labor Statistics. And we've got really good analysts looking at those numbers. So the reflection of, for leaders, why are people not coming back? I have jobs open. I've boosted the you know starting hourly rate by 25%. So therefore, everyone should love me. No, people- Not so fast, my friend. No, no, no. Right? If, if I'm not treated with respect, if I'm not validated for my ideas, efforts, you're not building loyalty. You're creating a transaction. And I think I want to go someplace different. It's got to be better than what I had. Yeah, I, th I think that that's right in so many ways. And so it's about what that culture is going to look like. And then, of course, there's a lot of peop people thinking about, like, what is the organization trying to do? Where are they trying to go? And I want to take us there. There's there's a phrase that you guys mentioned in the book, 
Well, first of all, there's a phrase that I'm guessing everyone who's watching us live, listening to us later has heard. And I'm guessing because we're sort of probably in many ways preaching to the choir here uh, are people who um, believe this phrase, yeah. servant leadership. Like yep. that word gets used a lot. But you said something different in the book. You talk about something called a servant purpose. Yeah. So what do you mean by that? And how does that even perhaps connect to servant leadership? But more importantly, what is that? What do you mean? Why hook those two words together? Well, uh, uh, well Chris, you should have taken this question, but let me, <laughs> let me, cause it's your phrase. And I, and I fell in love with it seven years ago. I fell in love with this because we had heard from Ken Blanchard on down the, the, the phrase servant leadership for, for some time. And frankly, it hasn't stuck as well as Ken Blanchard and crew might have hoped it would. And and Chris is uh, when I asked Chris about this, he he basically said, "Look, we can be servant leaders, and we will improve the culture, and the dynamics, the climate. What you know, what does it feel like to work here? Um, do I want to do I want to get out of that car and drudge to the front door every morning, or do I actually?" like have a little spring in my step as I, as I open the front door. And that's what servant purpose does for us. It, it allows us to focus on something other than the task, something other than making money. And, and um, the first time Chris explained this to me, he said, he said, you know, what is your company's servant purpose? And then he pauses for a second and says, other than making money. <laughs> And, and he does that with clients all the time because we have to tell leaders in a not so subtle way, I need you to step out of your normal where, yes, we know you're focused on results, but I need you to ignore that just for a second and tell me, how do you directly improve the lives of your employees, your stakeholders, your customers, your vendors, and so on? How are you making a difference in, in your community, in your industry, globally? How, what are you doing to contribute to the world's success? And, and so we, we had to make this a cornerstone in the book because it's, uh, and I'll tell you, Kevin, when, when, to, when we talk to leaders about this from, from startup founders that are, you know, their company's only three months old to fortune 100 companies, the light bulbs go off and it's like, holy, you know what? I've never thought of that before. Yeah. Well, my and team is tired of me hearing <laughs> we're trying to align, be missional and commercial. Right. It's the idea of like, if we get the mission right, if we get the purpose right, yeah. the rest will happen. Yeah. Uh, and, and and when we know we're doing something that works for both, then we got something. Yeah, that's, absolutely. that's the way we talk. I, I use the words for internally. I don't yeah. think I've ever said them outside of our team before right now, missionally and commercially. Perfect. They got to match. Well, and, and, and if I can, can add to that, one of the interesting things, again, back to our view of generations in, in the workplaces and Gen Ys and Gen Zs having very different drives, passions, desires for a work relationship, they're looking for meaning. They're looking for something that absolutely serves someone other than right the classic stakeholders. So that, that's a big part of this, too. Capital P purpose is another yeah. way that you could think about it. So I have a, uh, Craig has asked a question and uh, I was planning to take, go here later, but Craig's here and Craig's asking and uh, Craig may not stay if I don't acknowledge him, <laughs> validate him to Mark's point. So um, uh, Craig says, I'm interested to hear how one can create or adjust the culture where they sit. Because in other words, so many people, and I think where you're headed with this, Chris, and you can tell me if I'm wrong. Um, is that, well, this is a really important thing. And I wish my senior leadership was listening to Mark and Chris right now. So talk to this, because I, I was going to mention this later, like, where do I do if I'm not a senior leader? I think it's the same question. It so talk to, talk to Craig and all of us right now with this. Well, first of all, Craig, thanks thanks for jumping in. And uh, uh, Olivia and Fernando, I'm, we're watching your comments too. Um, thanks for contributing to the conversation. Uh, I will tell you that most of our conversations, although the book is probably written directly for the CEOs, the presidents, the executive directors, formal leaders. Yeah, the formal leaders, uh, the, you know, the C-suite, if you will, we're actually getting more questions like this from from outside the C-suite than we are from the old white guys that are that are uh, uh, 
you know, sequestered away in the in their in their offices and and haven't quite realized their impact on culture. And and we actually address this in the book, Craig. We talk extensively about culture as a top-down issue. Well, now we have to define top-down. And top-down can be if you're the leader of a small team, that's top-down. If you're the leader of a division or a department, that's top-down. And so we address this issue in the book by saying, if you are in control if, uh, of maybe not even your company's culture, you are in control of your subculture, your contagious pocket of excellence. And, and so it should be a top-down thing. Too often it is not, Craig. And, and we could, but we, we, us, my team of five, my, my engineering department, my IT department, my division, we can set out to say, look, let's, let's openly discuss the current company culture and then let's discuss how we want to work together, how we want to impress people and, and how we want to see each other with, you know, are we going to say good morning at night? Are we going to perform random acts of leadership? And if we see somebody working really late at night and we're still there, are we going to walk over and go, wow, you're, you're working late too. What are you working on? How can I help? What resources do you or need? Go home. Or, right? <laughs> or, or, or go home. Or, or go home. Yeah. I want to make a comment here that because I've had this kind of conversation, maybe not quite as elegantly, uh, Mark, as you're having it, as you're sharing it, but I've had this conversation with lots of people and they kind of sometimes look at me funny. I said, listen, you walk around your or your organization and is it exactly the same in every office? Is it exactly the same in every team? They're saying, they're, I'm, they're saying well, no, it's not. I said, that's right, because there's a company culture, but there's a team culture. There's a climate in the house and there's a climate in the room. And and we, I, I love the, the idea that you all you got to do is redefine top, yeah. right? Stop waiting for someone else, right? So Chris, do you want to add to this? I do. I, I think one of the most interesting things that I've, I've experienced over the years is getting a, a senior leader at a plant or a sales division or a pharma region. And they go, I can't, I'm not in charge of the broad culture. And it's really screwy. And and yet what I'm trying to build is this and I need your help to take it further. And so we've got so many wonderful examples of traction in the quote, let's call it the local level, that if you as a leader begin to emphasize that we're not going to, you know, treat each other, you know, as cogs in a wheel, these are humans, they have cool ideas, they, they proactively solve problems, sometimes early in the morning, sometimes at two in the morning, right, sometimes at seven at night, when everyone else has gone home. How do you create an environment where people bring that desire to want to serve? Again, they're still serving the company, but they're also trying to serve their customers. And so there's this wonderful, again, people show up, when you give them the validation that they deserve. And that's, it's very interesting because I remember having a conversation, this was in a finance company and, and this guy had, had taken this on. He had seven people in this department. He says, I've got people that I meet every day who say, I want to come for, to work for you because your people are happy. They are consistent. They, they have fun. And everybody else around here is not having a good time at all. Pretty cool. Well, and if you don't mind me adding to that really quick, Kevin, I, we already threw this phrase out once, but when you do everything that you and Chris just mentioned, you do create this, what we call a contagious pocket of excellence. And pretty soon, those people- Well, you who... create something. We hope well, it's a contagious well, pocket of excellence. Well, we hope a it's a pocket of excellence. Else. And as leaders, we hope it becomes contagious. Yeah. Because the, the teams that aren't having fun, that are maybe- living the 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 toxic company culture a little too faithfully they're eventually going to look around and they're going to go what are you guys doing different you're meeting all the metrics and you're treating people respectfully you're actually enjoying your work now work's not always fun that's not the point that's not the goal we're not going to sit around the campfire and sing kubaya songs but you're actually enjoying the commitment and you're enjoying the ride and i want to know what you're doing i i we're not doing that and i'm i'm not enjoying we were both same person signs our paychecks but you're enjoying your work and i'm not and now we start having really important conversations 
and see Chris just got some. You all <laughs> notice that Chris just got some feedback from Olivier. Uh, the big old smile on his face. What you don't know, Olivier, is you see that guitar in the background. He may not have. I mean, he, he's got a great voice, but he also has this other set of skills this that we're not having. Musician of the life. We'll talk about that later. Uh, probably not in the time that we have left. It's okay. uh, I have had that conversation with you, and it is not a short one. Uh, so, uh, so there's there's something, there's a big idea from the book I want to get to. But again, my very wise, our very wise audience is way ahead. So Brianna asked the question about what about the evolving culture created by remote work? Or I'll ask a related question to that about like how, if we're trying to do this work that you all are talking about and encouraging us to do, how is it impacted by when we're not all together all the time? So why don't you guys play off of that? And then there's, before, then before we start to wrap up, I've got one other sort of idea that I want you to share with the group, but talk a little bit about uh, what about the evolving culture created by remote work? What do we as leaders deal, do to deal with all of that? Boy, it's it's a huge, huge, interesting discussion that every leader needs to have. And one is if you had a lousy culture before and you boom, send it to people's, you know, working from home kind of environment where they have less opportunity to see people that they actually enjoy and can learn from in the workplace. And, and then you've got, people who's extroversion and and they think they're funny, et cetera, you know, ruining a Zoom meeting. It's, it's a very depressing experience for people. And so the dynamics of creating a culture that is based on good in a remote setting takes way more time and energy. And, and I tell leaders, Mark and I both coach leaders to say, as we start with leadership teams and get them started on a 12 to 18 month process, this, this is not a quick fix kind of a dynamic, but you're going to be investing 10 hours a week, 15 hours a week, probably eventually 20 hours a week, just on managing culture. And they're like, I've got all this other crap to do. No, you've hired people that are really good. That'll do that just fine. You're not going to let go of the demand to monitor results, but you're going to embrace the demand to monitor respect. It's it's pretty cool. And so in a working from home dynamic, boy, you've got to invest at least half the time on checking in with people. What do you need? How's your internet working? Right? How are how how you is need the other monitor? Exactly. How, thing, how, right? how how what's the what's the impact on your partner slash spouse slash elder care slash children dry kindergartner using your iPad to quote do remote learning. The dynamics are so so different and leaders cannot ignore that. They have to be present because all of that impacts people's ability to connect to the culture you want. Hey, Brianna, I'm just going to tell you, no one else will know this but you, but this is a big part of my next book. Oh, I, I, I think more than just Brianna heard that. Um, so <laughs> I do want to, uh, it's going to be a while. There'll be, you'll learn, if, you're, if you're following me here, uh, podcast or otherwise, you'll find a lot more as time goes along. I can't say too much more than that right now. But what I can do is ask you guys to talk about one of the big ideas in the book from my perspective. It's the idea of the organizational constitution. What do you mean? <laughs> it's the magic lever. It is, It is. if I can, what we want to do is take advantage of leaders' comfort with maybe even skills of managing performance, which means clear expectations and, and accountability. And we all know that clear expectations don't translate to accountability without engagement, without proactive monitoring, without coaching, without validating, without redirecting, et cetera. So what we're going to do is add, we tell leaders all the time, managing results is half your job. And they look at us kind of funny. Managing respect is the other half. So an organizational constitution, if we honored our, our, our forebears in Europe, we'd say Magna Carta. There's a number of other you know, references to kind of the classic, here's, here's what we stand for kind of documentation. So an organizational constitution is written. It's, it's a formal statement of the culture that leaders want. So it formalizes the servant purpose. Here's what we do to what end to serve others. These are our values. No more than four. Don't do 10. These are our behaviors that when we're modeling those behaviors, that means we're aligned to these values. And then here's our strategies and goals. So a servant purpose and values and behaviors, we hit the respect side. 
with strategies and goals, we hit the results side. But the idea of formalizing it means that we need to measure it. Yes, we need to measure both performance and, <laughs> and values, right? And to be able to validate folks that are doing the right thing, redirect folks that aren't. But it, it starts, uh, the, the language is so important that it helps people realize, oh, it's, it's what we're going to be expected to do. Um, I, Dorothy has asked a question uh, that is very practical. And we don't have time for you guys to go deep, but I'd love for you to give her some help here. So her question is, and a lot of you can see it, but she says, how do you handle respect when the colleague or teammates are being asked to do something they've openly stated they don't want to do? And if you, you ask me to do it, I'm going to go get another job. And she's not talking about unethical, but something they don't enjoy but they're the only one that can do it. And how do, in other words, she's saying, how do I support uh, or validate? Yeah. That? So well, I'll, I'll, there's I'll a whole you. podcast probably, but can you give Dorothy some quick advice on that? We, sure, we sure can. And Dorothy, there's a whole chapter in the book um, uh, dedicated to answering this question. And Chris and I, with our work together, we've, we've created what we call an accountability model and, and it helps leaders process the the accountability um i don't know hierarchy if you will first we need leaders themselves to model the values and behaviors we've defined in our organizational constitution that's first leaders whether it's that that leader of the team of five or department or the ceo of a fortune 100 company they must model those behaviors second they must coach those behaviors um, third, they have to measure them. They have to monitor them, which is why we help companies in the book define what a, what behavior might demonstrate that somebody's living that value, and then we can measure that. It's observable. It's measurable. Uh, next, we 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 absolutely must celebrate when people, teams, departments, projects are living those values and behaviors. We can't just say. Well, that's what you're getting paid to do, which is what most, what, which is what that's most what been trying old, to do. Right? old white guy leaders will say, well, of course you just got paid for doing what, you know, you're supposed to, I'm not going to celebrate that. Oh, no leader. You are from now on, you're going to do that because the good important. ones do. That's how we validate. That's how we support. And then finally, Dorothy, there's the mentor side of, of the accountability model. If somebody is absolutely not willing to live by the, the values, the behaviors to show respect as defined in the organizational constitution, well, then we have a problem, right? And the world, and Chris and I deal with this all the time right now, the world is full of, I will not get vaccinated. I will not wear a mask at work. It's it's not unethical to ask somebody to do that, but it also is a flashpoint, right? So it's hard right now, but here's the deal. Chris and I say this in the book repeatedly. Culture is built upon the behaviors that are rewarded. It is destroyed by the behaviors tolerated. And if we as a company decide this company is going to be vaccinated, this company is going to be masked in certain areas of the of the of the plants or whatever, and you don't want to live by that, then we 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 will respect you for that. We will not judge you for that, but you're not living we'll our good. values, and we're gonna let you go be successful somewhere else. We now, call it lovingly setting them free. Yes, setting and, them free to a new opportunity, Chris. Right. Uh, so, you know, so and we're getting some great stuff coming in. Fernando just said something that, I, I, that I'm going to just put back up here again. Uh, Fernando said, gets it. is an exhaustible yeah. fuel. I, I love that. And, and maybe I'm going to steal it, Fernando. I promise you, if I do, I'll let you. I'll, we'll give I'll, you credit. I'll people. We'll give you credit. Um, a nickel. We'll give them a nickel every time. <laughs> Now you're starting to sound like an NFT. And no, I'm not going to have someone talk about <laughs> NFTs on this show because it will nothing. explode my head. L I listen, got um, I've got a couple things I like to ask everybody. And then I've got a question I want to ask everybody who's watching us. So you used this word earlier, Mark. So you get to go first. What do you do for fun? Well, I uh, baseball is my fun. I have five kids and five grandkids and two dogs. So Fun is built into my life, um, but for real fun, for organized fun, I've coached baseball for 35 years. So baseball is my, uh, my passion. And frankly, I've, most of what I've learned about leadership has come from the baseball field. So it's fun and productive. Chris? 
I know it's on the it's on the wall behind. It you. is on the wall. It is and Joe, I want to loop back and say thank you for noticing the pink Paisley Telecaster. Uh, that's a Bill Crook Telecaster. He makes Brad Paisley's guitars as well. I'm a working musician. Been that way since the '70s. Lost a full semester <clears throat> when I was supposed to be doing classes in <clears throat> Southern California and chasing a record deal which never came about but i'm still a working musician um and i and and that's really a joy and so poor mark knows i've got another half dozen instruments in the music room humidified music room above um it's been a quiet couple of years for bands in uh in the pandemic times and we're starting to to get back up we do weddings and you know conferences and and we do festivals and stuff and some of those are coming back so uh that's what i do like I said, I can't go. I, I got to keep on a close <laughs> leak on that. Um, so now, Chris, I'll let you go first here. And uh, what are you reading these days? I am in the middle of Warren. Warren Peace? Warren Zane's biography of Tom Petty. It's not a surprise. I follow bands. I'm amazed at, at musicians and, and what they've gone through. And a lot of the, the music that influenced me from the 60s and 70s. Um, all, all these bands kind of all influenced each other, right? You think about kind of a, you know, who was connected to whom kind of a thing. And, and Leon Russell, you know, took Tom Petty in under his wing um, in, in L.A. early, early on. It's like all, all these influences keep coming back. So that's what I'm reading. Somehow yesterday on YouTube, I saw a thing about uh, Keith Richards talking about the first time he met Merle Haggard. Now, if you know both of those people, like that doesn't seem connected. But, but huge, connected. huge driver for, for Keith. Yep. Really cool. Uh, Mark, what are you reading? Two, two books. And I'm in the middle of both. Um, and I'm terrible, terrible at my multitasking, but I just, I just pick up one, whatever hits me at that moment. Um, the Long Game by Dory Clark. Fascinating study at how to how to get out of our short-term instant gratification system that we've built um around us as a prison i just uh, finished it she's a fellow linkedin learning instructor with me yep and she, uh, an excellent she, book and she's yeah. she absolutely amazing and then the second one is is um uh, it goes into a lot of what we talked about in the last uh, 30 minutes or so it's it's impact players by liz weisman who is equally as brilliant as dory is and as has, is taking this segment of our workplace and let's attach our star to the people that are really doing great work that 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 justifies our existence. So oh, see, I'm not telling you so, anything you don't already know. That's not is that is not true. So for those of you that are watching us live, go back uh, on my feed and you can find the conversation that I had with Liz here. And if you're watching, listening to the podcast. She will have, have been released just a few weeks before this. So you'll definitely want to do that as well. Now I have a question for all of you. All of you. Yes, you. Not Chris, not Mark, but you. Now what is the question? What are you going to do with this? Like what's what's the point? The point is not to hopefully, you know, maybe you're watching or listening while you eat your lunch or while you're exercising. Uh, that's fine. But the real value here is not to be entertained, but to take action on what you learned the learning that matters for us is the learning that we apply. So it is my encouragement and my urging to you, whether you say, hey, I need to think about clearer expectations. I need to think about this idea of servant purpose, purpose with a capital P. I need to think about the balance, the big idea today, the balance of respect and results. And what does that look like? I need to think about taking responsibility for culture where I live, not just waiting or hoping or sending a link to this off to my senior leader. Whatever it is for you, that's the key here, folks, and it's doing that that will make the biggest difference for you. So can one of you tell us where we can get a hold of this book, where we can connect with you? We'll put a bunch of stuff in the show notes later, but anything here, anything you want to point us to to let us know about the book or where to get a hold of both of you? Best place to go right now is goodcomesfirst.com. Goodcomesfirst.com. And, and if you can spell their names, uh, you can find them on LinkedIn. Uh, and other places, I'm sure that they'd want you to do that and, and reach out to them in that way as well. Um, we've got a couple of comments. I need to click over here real quick and see what people are saying before we go. Uh, oh, people saying, doing that. See, I'm not the only one. Uh, 
Steven is, says, highly recommended Dave Grohl's story. Fantastic. Dave Grohl's story. So there you go. Uh, apparently, Chris is on with that. And Susie is saying, I'm going to work on being more visible, speaking up, encouraging others, and continue to model what I see. Uh, Susie, I give you a huge gold star for that last part, continuing to model what I want to see. Because if we don't model it, it isn't going to happen. And so with that, let me thank both you guys for being here. Thanks so much. For joining Kevin, us. thanks for the opportunity. Always a delight. Yes. And thank uh, you, Kevin. I, you're very welcome. Listen, everybody, if you're here, if you're watching on, on whatever uh, social platform, either live or later, you know, I'm here every week. I'm going to be here twice next week, Monday and Thursday. So come join us then. And if you're listening to the podcast, you know that I'll be back next week with another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. Thanks, everybody. And for those of you live, happy Thanksgiving.